coordinator for High Rose Canada's uh, airport support services at Toronto Pearson International Airport. Jalen has been part of the Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers during COVID-19 team since its inception as she completed her practicum for her social work degree from the university. University of Toronto with the project. She has a strong commitment to social justice and continued growth, and I'm grateful that she has come to join us today. Take it away, Jalen. Thank you for that introduction, David. I will just share my screen. Okay. There. So again, thank you, David, for the introduction, and hello, everyone. As David said, my name is Jalen Smith. I'm the Airport Support Coordinator at Toronto Pearson International Airport for Kairos Canada. So I'd like to start by acknowledging that the work being done at the airport is made possible through the funding received from Employment and Social Development Canada under the Temporary Foreign Workers Program. So the following are the key stakeholders that we collaborate with at the airport to serve temporary foreign workers arriving in Canada, including Employment and Social Development Canada, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Agriculture, Greater Toronto Airport Authority, Canada Border Services Agency, Switch Health and Public Health Agency of Canada. To so begin our team at the airport, we had a team of uh, five on site, which is includes various backgrounds. We have a registered nurse, settlement services advisor, social work and community social services backgrounds, as well as information advisor and settlement and advocacy training. And each of our team at the airport speaks a second language, including Patois. We also um, make sure that we have a Spanish speaker for each of our shifts. So we work in two shifts. We have one Spanish speaker in the morning as well as one Spanish speaker in the evening shift. This is our team. Uh, bar one, who is missing for the photo. <laughs> so the services that we offer, um, we are available from the hours of 7 a.m. to 10.30 p.m. Monday to Friday. Our booth is located in Terminal 1, International Arrivals, on the public side. However, we cover Terminal Terminal 1 and Terminal 3 based on the flight schedule. So our services included guiding workers to the switch health process or arrivals testing based on their need. We provide them with an information folder, which is Service Canada's COVID-19 guide for temporary workers arriving in Canada. This is available in five languages, including Spanish, English, Tagalog, Thai, and French. The folders include the COVID-19 guide and four other information resources on emergency health care, protecting yourself from fraud, facts about COVID-19, and workplace health and safety offices and employment standards office numbers according to province. So in addition to that, we also provide our contact list, um, which includes our number as well as our 14, the numbers of 14, our partners. And we provide welcome bags that have PPE, hygiene items, water, and non-perishable food items. We also make sure that they know where they need to be for their next destination. Um, so some workers are getting a connection, some are being picked up by their employer or um, by another um, travel agency perhaps at the airport. And sometimes we even have workers who come who aren't necessarily aware of their next steps. In those instances, with the help of the workers, we'll reach out um, so employers and liaise with them to ensure that the workers get to their next destination. So currently we are providing these services to arriving workers, but we're also looking at doing wraparound services to provide um, services to departing workers as well. And then we also receive calls and make referrals to our partner organizations where applicable. So as I mentioned, Switch Health does the international arrivals testing at Toronto Pearson International Airport. Um, and so they do that arrivals testing um, for those that have not received their full vaccination um, with the government approved vaccines. However, if you are fully vaccinated passenger with the government approved vaccines, 
then you can bypass that arrival testing. So this was instated as of July 5th and workers exit through a separate entrance. So they'll exit underneath this international arrivals board. Um, however, even fully vaccinated passengers or temporary form workers can be randomly selected to go through that arrivals testing process. So this is the switch health process. Um, we are able to reach workers as in the first photo, they're coming out the door and that's entering into the public side. In the second photo, you can, well, you can't really see our booth, but off to the side of these lines that they come through is our booth. So we're able to capture workers once they're there. Um, we're able to speak with them, gauge their level um, of need for us to bring them through the process. The Switch Health has um, their own employees that are able to speak Spanish, French, and some other languages. However, depending on how many people are arriving at once, um, they tend to only have maybe one person who's able to speak that language and it's harder with big groups. So we're able to come through with them as well and provide that language support so that workers know exactly what they're doing, um, what they need to do. And so we can intercept them there. Um, so they have to register. They register usually on a phone or if they're unable to do that, they register at these stations here. At these stations are also given a swab with their name on it. And then they go along and they get tested by a switch health nurse in one of these sort of privacy stations. Then as they're exiting, they received an eight day test kit that has instructions inside of it. And public health agency is also there right before they exit. And then they wrap around back to our booth. So this is where we provide the folder that I mentioned, the COVID-19 guide for temporary form workers in Canada. This is also where we provide them with the welcome bags. Um, you can see uh, on the left-hand side, the most current version of our welcome bags, which we've updated to include some seasonal items for winter. So within that welcome bag, they're getting masks, hand sanitizer, um, hand wash, some snacks, razors, ear, cotton swabs. They get a blanket, a towelette, a scarf, mittens, and some socks. And we also uh, give them cold water and uh, offer them some extra granola bars and a mask that they can switch out there um, for the old one that they likely were wearing throughout the entirety of their travels. And as I mentioned before, we also gauge their need for further assistance. Um, some workers have been coming here for a long time and they know exactly where they need to go. Others might be more uncertain or might um, want our help moving to their next destination. So going beyond the airport. Um, in the information folders we provide, it includes the contact list you see on the right. So that contact list has our two phone numbers at the top um, with English, our English slash Tagalog line and then our Spanish number. It also has all 14 of our partner na names and numbers listed. Additionally, we have Calgary Catholic Immigration Society's 1-800 number, um, which covers Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. And on the bottom of the page is the Service Canada tip line number to report fraud or abuse. On the left, you can see our personal business cards that again has our two airport service numbers. Um, both the contact list and our cards have English and Spanish versions to provide to workers. And from providing these two methods of contact, we've received calls from workers at their places of employment or places of quarantine for continued support. So we even had a worker that told us that he was circulating our card to other temporary workers that he came across um, so that they could also engage with our services. So when we receive these calls at the airport, we provide support for airport related issues. And then we refer non-airport related issues to our partner organizations based on the temporary form workers location. So these are airport statistics to date. 
um, airport services started in the later part of our first phase of this project. So we started in May, and this is from May until November. So, um, and noted below, some of the totals uh, differ versus the gendered data, as we weren't initially collecting gendered data. So that's why you'll see some, a little bit of difference within the totals. And the handouts that we're providing on the top again are the COVID-19 uh, folders that include those information resources as well as our contact list. So some of the positives, we've received excellent feedback from temporary foreign workers that have been arriving in Canada. A lot of them express gratitude that we are there um, to be able to provide that support, especially um, as with COVID-19, there has been a lot of change and a lot of people are very confused as to what they need to do, what they don't need to do. Um, even those who are coming out of that fully vaccinated exit um, often think that they still need to be tested upon arrival. So we're there to provide that support to um, the temporary farm workers and we've received a lot of great feedback from them. We're also gaining recognition within the airport through collaboration with Switch Health, Public Health, and other stakeholders that are there. A lot of people are coming to know exactly, who have come to know exactly who we are um, and just collaborating with them. We've also had temporary form workers that have reached out for continued assistance. So as I said, they've reached out over WhatsApp and over the phone to let us know of things that are happening at their places of employment, if they have following follow-up questions. So we've had them reach out to us and we've been able to provide that support and refer them to our partners as well to provide continued support beyond the airport. So challenges. Uh, there have been, there's been a lot of change and growth since we began at the airport services in May. We've had excellent feedback um, from our stakeholders, but as we began, there was also almost constant change. So when we first started almost every other week, there was something different that we would have to um, information gather and adapt to so that we were providing the most up-to-date information um, to the temporary form workers arriving. However, as the restrictions have eased, um, we've had more of an equilibrium in terms of airport procedures applicable to our work. In the beginning, we had, there was the hotel quarantines and a bunch of different stickers depending on um, where you were going or depending on if you're going to a hotel or not. And now there are less of those procedures and there hasn't been nearly as much change over time. Now, one of the challenges that we have, which has also been one from the beginning, is the unpredictable number of workers arriving. Um, so we're always surveying the exits and moving from terminal one to three based on the patterns of arriving workers that we've established through ob observation. So because we've been there since May, we've been able to establish patterns which flights we tend to have temporary foreign workers on. And so we're able to move between the terminals and uh, based on that flight schedule. Uh, but that was something that we had to garner through our observation and through just experience at the airport. And then we also need to, because we have our booth and because we are providing resources and welcome bags, we need to make sure that we're constantly stocked with all of our supplies, which can be sometimes a challenge when the number of workers fluctuate week to week. So sometimes we'll have to replenish um, three times a week. Other times it's only once a week because we've had a fewer number of workers. So there is that, there is that fluctuation and kind of adaptability that we constantly need to have in order to make sure that we are providing service to all of these workers that are arriving. And that is it for me. Um, I can answer more questions in the Q&A period, but 
if you don't have them during that time, this is also my email. So you can send me an email for any follow up questions as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Jalen. And yes, I can imagine there's been a lot of change just in terms of seeing the resources that have been coming out over um, the past year of the project. There's been some major shifts in uh, expectations. Mm -hmm. So I imagine at the airport, there's quite a bit of <laughs> adapting going on week to week in terms of process. So thank you for that overview. So as we continue on, we're going to be heading west. So uh, we're going to be heading to Alberta to hear from uh, Jocelyn Davies, uh, Jocelyn Davis, uh, project manager with the Calgary Catholic Immigration Society, talking about what services are available uh, in Calgary. So welcome, Jocelyn. Thanks, David. Um, hi, everyone. So my presentation is a little bit more informal. Um, I'm just going to be speaking. I don't think uh, a PowerPoint will be quite as helpful because my background for this project is um, not as airport specific. So the focus is a little bit more about how it connects to the whole project. And to me, that felt like a discussion. So if you have any questions, um, I will be happy to answer as many as possible, but I do have to leave a little bit early, but I'll put my email and the email of my colleague in the, uh, the chat so that you can connect with us by, by email thereafter if we aren't able to address questions uh, today. So as David mentioned, my name is Jocelyn Davis. I am one half of the team at CCIS that's overseeing this TFW Prairie Region project funded by ESDC. My colleague Jessica, I think, is on the call as well. Um, to give a little background, I've worked at CCIS for almost five years in various capacities throughout the organization. Um, and then for the last year, I've been connected to this project. But as I mentioned, my role is a bit behind the scenes, um, kind of keeping an eye on the coordination component of this project. So I want to start with a, a quick land acknowledgement. In the spirit of respect, reciprocity, and truth, we honor and acknowledge the traditional Treaty 7 territory and oral practices of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Sisika, Kainai, Makani, as well as the Stony Nakoda and Satim Nations. We acknowledge that this territory is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. Finally, we acknowledge all nations, Indigenous and non, who live, work, and play, and help us steward this land, honour, and celebrate the territory as we recognize uh, that we are all treaty people. Um, so to give a little bit of background, uh, CCIS, the Calgary Catholic Immigration Society, for 40 years has been offering settlement and integration services and support to immigrants and refugees in Southern Alberta. We're the largest immigrant serving uh, agency in the Prairie Provinces and the fourth largest in Canada. And CCIS delivers 95 programs that are diverse and tailored to the needs of the clients uh, out of seven locations and 25 outreach locations. Uh, for this project, we are the recipient organization for the ESDC funded TFW COVID support project. Uh, and we've been funded since December 2020. Since December, we've established a network of 17 partner organizations, uh, which comprises other SPOs within the prairies, um, both rural and urban, as well as the umbrella organizations for the prairies in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, as well as provincial grassroots migrant worker organizations. Um, so, the airport component of our project um, is building off of the existing port of entry services that CCIS offers. Um, CCIS has been a port of entry service provider since 1997, and during this time we've established relationships with the Calgary Airport Authority and the CVSA, and have secure access for some of the staff to be able to provide navigation support kind of behind the scenes. Um, we also have a permanent office in the international arrivals area. So for the, the bulk of the TFW support, it is provided once they have already cleared through and are in the arrivals area. That's where we um, connect with the majority of them. But as I said, some staff are able to move smoothly through the airport in general um, if anyone gets um, stuck and needs additional assistance. Um, we... 
Uh, we've also recently expanded our port of entry services to partner with a francophone settlement service provider. And recently CCIS was selected by IRCC to become a hub for the Afghan resettlement project. So it's a, a busy little area for us. Um, as the largest airport and service provider in the prairie, CCIS has also established, has established communication structures in place with the other um, service providers in the prairies. Uh, particularly those who are existing RAP providers serving government-assisted refugees. And that's really been helpful for the TFW project because those are the same partners that formed the initial group of organizations that joined our network. And so we're able to advise them about um, any inbound TFW that are destined to their communities when we serve them at the airport. So that ease of communication has really been helpful. Um, the specific services that we provide at the airport are created because we recognize that Canada, arriving in Canada can be a stressful experience and that with COVID these challenges are, are more pronounced and the procedures and protocols are always changing as uh, was mentioned previously. So there is a need for additional support navigating these systems for TFWs, even for those who have come to Canada year on year as seasonal agricultural workers. Um, so our airport services for this project have combined the 24 years of uh, port of entry experience and the 13 years of experience providing services to TFWs. So it's been an interesting process uh, bringing these two worlds together. Um, and as a result of them all being under the same organization, CCS is able to grow the port of entry services to support the TFWs and integrate these TFW airport services into our overall project delivery. So it's quite uh, seamless or as much as a new initiative could be. Um, at the airport ourselves, we provide a reception um, similar to what Kairos does. We provide a care package which includes health and safety supplies, hand sanitizer, mask, that sort of thing, um, two socks um, depending on, on the weather, um, and then also some appropriate food supplies just to make sure that they have something on hand for when they arrive. Uh, we also provide information about the program. Uh, this includes uh, contact information about the service providers who are connected to the project, um, including rural ones that would be closest to the, the location of the TFW, um, COVID prevention information, and then we also provide some information about our website. So there's a designated website for this project, and within the website there is a uh, like a sign-in page and if the worker puts their information in that um, that form it registers them into our database and automatically triggers a follow-up for the case worker in the SPO closest to where this worker is destined so um, that is a, a helpful feature. The majority of the support that we were providing beyond the, the airport reception and the care packages was language and documentation support, so uh, interpretation and assistance completing arrival paperwork, as well as the COVID testing support and assistance understanding the COVID protocols. Um, so the staff at the airport, there is both male and female Spanish speaking staff, as well as staff that speak a range of other languages, including Arabic, Farsi, Tagalog, uh, Russian, Turkish, and some others. So. For the TFWs, the Spanish is obviously the, the most in need, but it doesn't hurt to have others. Um, we have found that the majority of TFWs coming through the Calgary airport are actually met at the airport by their employers. So the, the quarantine and the, the isolation hotels and all that sort of stuff wasn't a major component of the services that we were providing, but all of that logistical infrastructure is in place, um, but it just wasn't, wasn't a big piece. Um, as, as was mentioned, there is a 1-800 number for uh, this project, which is included in our information. It's available after hours and again, it directs calls to the service provider in the, the area of the worker. Um, and in the first contract, we saw that about 40% of all of our clients had connected with the airport services in some way. Um, obviously, the majority of them are the seasonal agricultural workers that were coming on chartered flights. Um, so overall, uh, all new undertakings, of course, have their challenges, but we've learned a lot over the last year about what works well for this client demographic, uh, which pieces need further refinement, and also which interventions would be helpful moving forward. Um, as was mentioned, the, the unpredictability of arrivals is definitely a challenge that we confronted as well. 
Um, there were large numbers that would come all at once with these chartered flights, but with the COVID restrictions, we were prevented from providing in-depth services to these arriving TFWs in the airport. Um, we had originally hoped that we would be able to provide um, a needs assessment or an information session on site, but um, the workers were encouraged to understandably uh, continue kind of moving through the airport. And so that's where that information about the website and the 1-800 number and the direct contact information for each of the partner organizations was important. So um, that was just a way that we were having to adapt to the, the needs that we were seeing. Um, so the other thing is the information about arrivals wasn't centralized. Um, we tended to know about arrivals either from employers who, who had identified that they had um, arranged for a chartered flight to come or through a contact at the CBSA. Um, but that didn't always mean that we had a lot of heads up. Um, so we, we too struggled sometimes to ensure that there were enough packages prepared and supplies were at the ready, particularly because some of the arrivals were actually larger than we were told. So we would expect a certain number and then significantly more would come. Um, the other challenge is that we don't have as robust an information uh, retrieval system for domestic arrivals. We, we know that the chartered flights are coming directly to the Calgary International Airport, but for international uh, flights that first start somewhere else in Canada and then come to Calgary, um, since our office is based in the international area of the airport, um, we aren't necessarily going to stumble across those, uh, those TFWs. So still trying to figure out if there's a better way to, um, to be able to capture those who are arriving on domestic flights. Um, overall, we, we feel that it would be helpful if the federal government could help bridge um, relationships and connections with key stakeholders, um, particularly to facilitate this information sharing. Uh, and one key, one key challenge was developing the, uh, the trusting relationships with the consulate. Sometimes there is hesitancy to share information about arriving TFWs or kind of sharing space at the airport if they were also wanting to kind of provide support. But this was something that we attributed to growing pain since it was new and that with more time, it will just become business as usual and these processes will become more streamlined. Um, so those were the, the main challenges, uh, but there were some successes as well, for sure. Uh, despite any of these challenges, we received very positive feedback, as Kairos did as well, um, about the services provided. So almost immediately, we started receiving requests for support for departure uh, services. I think it was something that both TFWs and employers quickly identified as being a, a way of easing stress of an uncertain future. And so knowing that there was going to be someone who could provide updated and accurate information or some logistical support on the way out um, was quickly quickly something that was of interest. So what we did is we designed pre-departure information sessions to, um, to equip the TFWs before they travel with the information about um, safety measures, requirements, uh, vaccination documentation, all of that. And we found that it was most successful to actually do this while they're still at their place of employment, just because they are easier to access, um, everyone's in the same place. And then if there are any questions, concerns or issues, we still had time to, to figure that out before they're actually in the airport um, needing to leave. So um, one of the challenges that we did find, which is why the advance notice is helpful, um, is that the vaccination records, sometimes the names weren't aligning um, or there was a misspelling or something and it just takes a little time to sort that all out. So getting a head start with these pre-departure information sessions is helpful, but we do have a physical presence at the airport. Um, so should something arise at the time, there is someone who would be able to assist. Um, another benefit um, or success of having the airport services is that it created uh, an easy way of starting to build rapport with both the TFWs and the employers. Um, Overall for this project, employer engagement has been a bit of a struggle just because it is something quite new. And so to be able to offer something as tangible as um, interpretation support or uh, help with the COVID measures at the airport started to show that there was a, a real 
advantageous relationship that um, us as a service provider with this program can, can provide them. And then for the TFWs themselves, they were able to, again, receive very tangible support through the care packages, which um, again, made us a, a trusting source of information and support. And when we were doing outreach on farms or with mobile vaccination clinics in rural centers, there were a number of clients who um, who said that they recognized the faces that had supported them at the airport. And so they then asked questions or sought more information because it felt like a continuity. Um, so that worked out well for us as well. Um, so this is, I think, probably where I'll stop it now because I know that there's other people who need to speak. Um, but I did want to thank all of you for coming today and hearing me out. Um, I'll just put my information in the chat so that if you have any questions, you can, and uh, hopefully I can answer some of them in the Q&A section. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. I learned quite a bit. I think it's a fantastic setup from the sounds of it. Um, Thank you for all your work uh, and for letting us know about it. <laughs> um, yes, so we're gonna continue west and then we'll have uh, the Q&A session, but uh, you can put uh, questions in the chat. I'm seeing some already. Um, and I'm sure if there are questions specific to Jocelyn in the chat, she can probably engage there as well. Uh, and she's gonna put her email in as well. Oh, there it is. Um, so as we continue over to BC, uh, we have uh, Mustafa Delzas, uh, manager of the Community Airport Newcomers Network from uh, Success BC to talk about uh, the services provided uh, in BC. So welcome, Mustafa. Hello, everybody. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out the Zoom. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Mustafa, and I'm the program manager of the Community Airport Newcomers Network. Um, and uh, this program uh, is part of the uh, services, one of the services that Success provides. Uh, and some of you might know Success is one of the largest settlement organizations uh, in BC. It has around 40 service locations across Canada with international offices in China and Korea. Um, and uh, the program that I work uh, for CAN was established in 1992 um, as a, a response to the arrivals of, uh, of the new immigrants from Hong Kong. So, um, you know, IRCC at that time, CIC, uh, wanted to share, you know, um, live uh, information about settlement to Canada. And then later on in 1997, the program was um, um, ex uh, expanded to include the uh, uh, services for refugees. Um, and uh, in uh, 2019, we've got the contract from ESDC to provide um, airport arrival services to temporary foreign workers. Um, so that's a little background before I get into the detail um, of, of the specific program. Um, uh, sorry, the slideshow from the beginning. Um, no, I'll just stay here. So I would like to thank both David and Jocelyn for doing a land acknowledgement. Um, I would uh, highlight that we this program is located at the traditional lands of the Moscow, Squamish, and Tleil-Waututh nations, and our airport is um, located in the lands of the Moscow people. Um, and success acknowledges the ancestral and traditional territories of indigenous peoples across the regions that we live and work. We express our gratitude and honor to the indigenous peoples who are the keepers of these lands that have existed since time immemorial. Um, um, I am currently um, finishing my degree in, in social work and uh, most of uh, our studies, you know, we engaging with, with acknowledging and raising awareness about what's happening to indigenous people is very important to me personally, plus uh, to our organization. Um, uh, so this is our uh, program. It's located in the inside the CBC immigration room. Uh, we have a kiosk, we call it a kiosk, where um, uh, uh, immigrants um, and temporary, so um, 
newcomers can come to us and we do a quick needs assessment and then we um, provide them the needed information. Uh, with the temporary foreign worker uh, program, we provide services in two streams. One of them is the um, uh, agriculture workers and the other one is the uh, employer specific work permit holders. Uh, that means the uh, employer specific work permit holders would approach our um, uh, case managers once their immigration interview is done. Uh, but for the temporary, for the agriculture workers, it's uh, based on our arrival notifications where we schedule stuff and respond um, you know, to the schedule that we, uh, we get. So there's two different uh, ways we provide the services. Uh, in our contract with the ESDC, uh, we have uh, the objectives of our program is to provide um, assist TFWs with the immigration landing process. So we work closely with CBSA. We locate in the same room. Uh, we provide uh, in orientations in the uh, CBSA room about their rights in Canada. And then uh, starting 2019, we, uh, 2020, we were really focused on providing information about COVID-19. And we focus on referrals to community organizations. Uh, uh, um, on top of providing orientations, we also distribute resources that, um, uh, you know, highlight information about rights and community organizations. So this our main objective is to provide orientations and provide resources. Um, as I've mentioned, our, um, uh, uh, so the two streams of the work that we provide, the categories for the seasonal agriculture worker program that I think Jocelyn and Jalen were talking about as well as this uh, um, uh, so that's the uh, orientation that we provide to the AG stream and season agriculture workers but one-on-one -on -one support um, you know uh, individual support is for other categories such as caregivers food service workers IT specialists transportation workers and construction workers and so on. Um, and, and that would mean that we just, you know, quickly uh, tell them about their rights in Canada, about their contracts, and, and, and if they have any issues, who to contact. Um, um, and just a number that uh, since the beginning of our program, we've provided our services to 25,500 total clients. Um, how do we do that? What is included in our brochure? So uh, we've developed this brochure in 2019. And the reason why we did that is because of our experience uh, with the uh, uh, newcomers and the refugee program. Um, although we are we were contracted to only uh, provide information for workers distant, distant in British Columbia, based on our experience, we developed resources for um, Ontario and Saskatchewan and Alberta as well. So, so um, once clients were going to those um, uh, provinces, we would refer them to the organizations that are there to provide services. So, what's so we provide two major resources that are um, developed by us. One of them is our uh, brochure, and the other one is the um, um, wallet size card, and that was accented by uh, ESDC. Uh, for safety reasons, um, and, you know, so it's, you know, small thing you can put in your pocket. If, if a worker is in danger, they can quickly contact. So uh, all these resources are developed in English, French, Spanish, Tagalog, Chinese, Korean, Hindi, and Punjabi. Um, and uh, we have staff that speak uh, these languages plus uh, 20 more. Uh, the topics, oops, sorry, I just... <laughs> The top email, the topic uh, uh, discussed, uh, covered in the uh, um, brochures are preparation for the immigration interview. So, uh, if uh, uh, that would be for the employer specific work permit holders or closed work permit holders, so they would come and see us, we'll tell them what to prepare for. And, um, you know, this is about five to 10 minute uh, conversation, uh, but also applies to the EG stream and the uh, SOP. Important documents and applications, so social insurance number uh, and other related work permits, uh, health insurance, uh, rights, so, you know, contract uh, obligations and, and stuff related, reporting issues, so the go, um, needed government uh, departments and phone numbers, as well as a referral section uh, and the general resources. Uh, that we have a, a team of we have a, t a person who is you know uh, focusing on development and updating resources and, and, and stuff like that. 
Um, and um, so our key partners, partners have been since the inception of the program. Um, Mexican Consulate uh, uh, was uh, very helpful uh, when the program started because they are, uh, they are organized in a different manner. They know when the workers arrive. So they, they you know, would let us know uh, when workers arrive. So then we can schedule staff and, and then prepare for the arrivals. Of course, the CBAC were located in the same room um, and we, you know, we work uh, closely. And this was very important once uh, the country was shut down last year. Um, so the only two programs working at the, out of the airport was CBSA and uh, our program. And we responded to all the charter flights that arrived and, you know, um, made sure that um, the protocols are followed and stuff like that. Uh, Mitiera was uh, is the organization that helps to facilitate after they leave the airport, so connect them with their employers and and providing meals uh, after they they're, they're finished uh, from the airport, and so on. Um, challenges, uh, so we have uh, limited arrival notifications, um, and we've you know informed uh, ESDC about this. Um, for our, our other programs, uh, we get, um, you know, five to seven days notifications, but this program so far, maybe because it's new, you know, it, it's, uh, it's in the process of development. Flight delays, um, uh, you know, it happens that flights, uh, with the charter arrivals specifically a couple of months ago in May and June, flights would come for five, four hours or three hours later, and that would, you know, affect scheduling and, and related matters. Um, flight arrivals before 6 a.m. and after 10 p.m. with the SOP workers from Mexico. The flights land at 5.30, so we have to be here to uh, meet the workers. And there is um, a number of, you know, 100 or more, 120 per flight. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, and then after 10 p.m., sometimes uh, services last past 12 or 1 a.m. and our program staff are here at the airport. Uh, COVID test delays. So at the beginning, once uh, we uh, started the program, um, in the airport together, you know, we're figuring figuring out how to respond to the regulation, federal regulations, um, and that added about two hours to our regular services. Um, successes, I think, the obvious success is that you know, assistance with the work permit issuance. So, so we speak the languages. If there's an issue, if there's a need for interpretation or facilitation of any. Um, you know, matters or questions that workers have, we're always there. Um, assistance with document loss at the airport happened multiple times where people lost their passports. So we've uh, we've helped to issue, we've facilitated with the CBC to issue one day permits, you know, connected with the consulates, made police file reports, uh, came back to the airport um, and give, you know, uh, assistance with, with new passports. Um, and then other times they would lose passports or other documents in the airport. So we're there to help that. Responses to emergencies, so missed flights, very common. Um, um, so we're, you know, we, we help with that. Um, medical calls, uh, baggage loss or damage. So, you know, sometimes um, you know, it happens to all of us. Some of the baggages may be damaged and we assist them to, uh, meet with the airline representatives to make claims so they can get financial re re reimbursement. Um, referrals. So, um, as I've said, that uh, um, we are, our referrals are, are completed by the city of final destination of workers. So, if somebody is intended to go to, um, you know, Edmonton, would highlight the organization that is in Edmonton and that is that can help them with um, uh, community services. Um, yeah, and our our operations are from um, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. seven days a week, and uh, for the SOP workers, uh, we work 24 hours seven days a week based on the notifications. Um, so I'm the program manager. Uh, we have Sulun. I think he's part of this call too. He's the senior manager, and um, we have a team of staff uh, up to 30 people working with this program. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Very informative. Looks like a fantastic program as well. It's great to see so many um, fully realized services available for 
uh, TFWs as they arrive in Canada. Um, we have a few minutes left before Jocelyn has to head out. So um, we're going to start into the Q&A period. Uh, you can either raise your hand uh, using that function um, or uh, put your questions in the chat. Um, Brian, we are going to get to your question, but um, I'm going to go to Roland because he had a question early on. So uh, take it away, Roland. Uh, yeah, I have a several question here, but um, the first one I have is uh, with the airport service that we have in uh, Toronto or in uh, Pearson. I know you guys are giving. Uh, uh, Jaylin is also already giving the uh, the COVID care kit. Uh, do we have to repeat that in here when they get here, or is it a duplicate? What do you think would be the your suggestion? Hi, Ron. Hey. Just to clarify, you're referring to the welcome bags, yes? Yes, we have the same welcome bag, uh, welcome kit. So we have also, you know, we provide a lot of, of those. Uh, so would that be, I know probably Scone is an answer or qu uh, a question uh, to, to, to her. But uh, so that's one of my questions, um, whether, you know, uh, I know we haven't heard anything yet. I think I only heard once that coming into uh, New Brunswick. Uh, uh, so the second question I have is uh, just just an estimate. How many have you served uh, up, up to date? And uh, which ethnicity have the highest arrival of TFW, you know, since you began? Do you have? Um, yes. So who would like to uh, speak to that? We have... Um, I know we had some data um, okay. in Jalen's, uh, but Mustafa, if you want to talk to um, what population you're serving. Yeah, uh, and how yeah even, you know, even uh, Jocelyn yeah. and Mustafa can yeah. take the answer that one. Go ahead, Mustafa. Um, so 80% uh, of the workers that we provide our services to are uh, agriculture workers and, um, and, and beyond that is the work, such a long name, closed work permits. So other employer specific work permit holders are 20% of our total clients. Um, yeah, echoing that, the overwhelming majority of the clients served at the airport are seasonal agricultural workers, and nearly all of them are from um, Mexico and Central America. So there are other um, TFWs, like major populations of TFWs served by the project, but they are um, typically workers who are here year round. They may be working in the, the service sector or something. They're not seasonal agricultural workers. So yeah, ours is a uh, very Spanish speaking heavy, um, Mexico, Guatemala, uh, and Nicaragua, I believe are the, the three highest. All right, I'm going to move over to uh, Brian's question. Um, so many in Latin America have been double vaxxed with Sinovac, uh, approved by WHO, but not by Canada. Uh, some have received booster shots of Moderna or Pfizer. Um, have there been experiences of this situation affecting entry into Canada um, and or eligibility for these programs? If any of the three of you have experience with uh, vaccines outside of the approved Canadian ones. Uh, this isn't something that I personally have had a lot of um, exposure to, but it is something I can check back with the team and um, report back either at a future meeting or if you'd like to email your question, I can get back to you. And while I have the floor, I will just be uh, stepping out. So thanks everyone. And please feel free to connect by email later. Um, and thank you, David and the rest of the Kairos team. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Bye. Take care. Uh, Mustafa, I saw your hand up. 
if Jalen would like to go, Jalen would like to go ahead. <laughs> Sorry for mispronouncing your name. Okay. Um, so for us, for obviously meeting um, workers that have been, have entered into Canada. Um, so I can't say if, if there were workers who were um, kept from entry due to their vaccination status. As I mentioned in my presentation, um, we still do have workers who are coming through that um, fall on the, under the designation of not being fully vaccinated. Um, for us, they just have to go through um, entry testing with Switch Health. Um, now, I can't say in terms of um, which vaccine or what exactly um, their non-fully vaccinated status encompasses, because if you're not fully vaccinated, that could be you have one of the approved vaccines, you have um, the non the non-approved vaccines. So that is my that's my knowledge of it. From what we know is that uh, there is no requirement uh, to be vaccinated to enter Canada for workers, uh, uh, sub workers and agriculture workers because they're deemed as essential workers, but they could not leave Canada without being vaccinated. So they can come to Canada, you know, without a vaccine or whatever vaccine they have, but once they're in Canada to leave, then they will get, uh, you know, um, approved Canadian vaccine. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, Martin, you have a question? Hello, yes, I have a situation I want to share. There is many migrant workers, especially from Honduras and Guatemala that, uh, coming to here to Ontario, but the flight is, uh, landed first in Quebec or in other provinces when they were receiving the vaccination. So there is an issue because we were working at the vaccination clinics right here, but we cannot put together the two vaccines. And some of them, they lost the paper or they didn't receive the, the proof uh, at the airport. And it is a lot of problem for them because they cannot even, they were vaccinated in Canada, the two vaccines, they can approve they have the two vaccines. So it's kind of a very bad situation. Another situation is uh, workers that they come in from their own countries with the first uh, doses with um, vaccines that are not um, um, approved by Canada but we were uh, giving the two doses, but they don't have a way sometimes to prove that they have the two doses. So there is a few issues to them when they go back to their own country. Certainly, um, I know we've dealt with a case where um, tracking down the vaccination records uh, came into play in terms of uh, departing workers. So I think it's um, trying to collate all of the data from the different um, stakeholders can definitely be a challenge. I have Connie with a hand. Can you go ahead. Thank you so much, David, and thank you, Mike for, for the question, because I think that's where your, you know, our community partners um, are coming in. What are the requirements, you know, at both at the airport in, and also in the countries that they're going home to with regards to vaccination, COVID-19, pre-departure tests and so on. So, uh, we need to know that so that we can provide workers the accurate and the right information so that we're preparing them uh, before, you know, the actual date of departure. It's going to be very, yeah, very stressful when they're at the airport already and they're turned down, turned away because they don't have the documents. So that's, uh, that's very critical. The other thing too is ensuring that, you know, uh, the relationship with public health or Ministry of Health uh, with regards to having the proof of vaccines available to these workers. Uh, 
we had that case at the airport, I think, that the, um, the, the airport, in terms of getting, you know, uh, the full, uh, well, the certificate of two dosage or receiving full vaccination. So this is, uh, this is very important, actually, in terms of, you know, the airport uh, services, both in Toronto and Edmonton, and also in, in Vancouver, coming coming together, doing this webinar, sharing information on the work and the services being provided so that we community partners, allies and supporters and even migrant workers would know that this service is available at the airport. So it's, it's great to have this, uh, this webinar and thank you Mustafa and I know Jocelyn has left, but Jessica Thank you so much, Kami. Uh, Martin, your hand is back up. Today, I'm more I just want to share a little bit uh, what we've been doing. Lucy has been contacting the Quebec uh, Health Unit used to try to get the proof for those workers and uh, used to help them and to, he to have the, the two vaccinations probes. We have a question in the chat about Quebec. Um, we don't have a representative from Quebec. Um, are we aware of any services um, in terms of uh, support services at the airport uh, available in Quebec? Do, does anyone have an awareness of what's going on with our French Canadian friends? Uh, Jalen? Yes, Connie was going to go. Even you can add more. Uh, there's actually an organization in Quebec that, you know, that is supported also by Service Canada to provide this information. It's, it's, um, yeah. This earlier that, you know, to bring in our Quebec counterpart, uh, you know, the work they're doing in Quebec with regards to providing their support services. Thing to add on that, Jalen, or? No. Are there any uh, further questions in that anyone is? Considering, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, I was also wondering about, <laughs> I'm always interested in stories. Um, what have you found has been the most sort of impactful moment for you uh, in terms of providing these services, either Mustafa or Jalen? Like, is there a sort of standout moment in terms of like, you know, like getting a sense of the importance of this work? I think it's sort of the continued communication that we'll have from some of the workers. So we have the workers that we see at the airport and sometimes those can be quicker interactions or we can help them to their next um, destination, but then just receiving those calls afterwards to hear about how they're doing or to have that continued support. Um, I feel like that is really, really excellent, really impactful for us because um, they'll say that they remember us and they'll reach out. And I shared the, um, the anecdote about the one worker who said that he had um, met us at the airport and now he was circulating our business cards to any, any of the other temporary foreign workers that he was coming across um, so that they could also receive the support that we were providing to him and I felt very touched and that was really something that was impactful for us at the airport. Um, for us I think uh, 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 there's one of our work uh, like uh, case managers um, have shared that uh, one of the workers um, 
worked in, in so you know once uh, the person told them about the services available and that they could uh, you know reach out for uh, to government uh, for any services uh, uh, this worker was from Korea and she started like crying because uh, uh, she's been working in Canada for five four or five years and the employer promised her that uh, she will uh, help her apply for a PR and uh, but then he did not and then he um, um, the also did not pay for the hours of work uh, the way that need to be um, the uh, so there's a lot of abuses have you know took place and uh, and this person you know start, got very emotional and so very very thankful for for this service being available um, so that that was one of the highlights that we had highlights in terms of the need of the program but not for the for the yes. <laughs> Yes, um, but definitely good to have that that point of connection, that sort of listening ear at the very least, but also um, to sort of form that connection with uh, further organizations. Uh, go ahead, Connie. I'm sure if Jaden has shared this, but um, you're. You're, sorry, you're cutting out. Yeah. This, this is my internet connection. Um, uh -huh. Where Carlos was asked to provide uh, the airport support services at the Toronto International Airport, just because there is a huge gap in terms of providing and welcoming workers when they arrive at the airport, especially in the midst of the pandemic and this, you know, uh, regularly and constantly relations uh, uh, really for temporary for workers uh, during COVID-19. But, you know, we, we were at the airport, we were faced with a lot of challenges, but also with lots of fulfilling and kind of satisfying reaction from themselves. Because you can totally, totally be lost in all of these lines and cues and different people asking you different um, documents. And, and especially if both either the public health or CBSA or those piece, key uh, stakeholders are not providing or are not speaking in the languages that are, you know, easily understandable to, to the workers. So when we started having workers that uh, airport staff that very, very helpful and, and workers were really very grateful actually for the additional ear or, you know, person that they can approach and talk to and just share the concern and, and be assisted and accompanied in, in the different lines that they have to go through. So that's all the challenges and despite being the new kid in the back. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, and, 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 you know, from that experience to the present, we've started to really get the trust of the workers uh, so after being received at the airport, they would call back uh, and say, even just to say thank you so much for also sharing more concerns and just when they get to their final day. Thank you so much, Connie. Uh, Roland, I saw that you... Did you have another question or? Uh, well, I'm gonna ask about uh, the same question I asked with Jailene about, uh, you know, uh, if they given already the uh, the COVID care kit uh, in the airport, when they get to our destination in New Brunswick or Nova Scotia, PI, whatever, uh, do, we, do we give them another uh, COVID care kit for Connie? Then you can respond both, but I'll start. Sorry, I didn't get that one. What did you say? Oh, which province or final destination they're going to? 
uh, we do not push for that information unless the worker is provided, you know, um, voluntarily. Um, we don't want to. We don't want to be seen as. Uh, yeah. So, so we have to give them a, a, you know, if they arrive in here, uh, even though you've given already, we don't have to ask them about uh, if they got if they got in a COVID care kit from you guys. That's my only question. This is breaking. So. We know that a worker is going to New Brunswick and they've already been provided with a care kit at the airport. We can we can let you know, but oftentimes don't get that information to okay. where they are going. To. So there's no way we can tell you or any other partners, say in, in PEI, in Brunswick, and even in Ontario. Yeah, no. And, and what, secondly, yeah, it's a big issue if the worker get second a second bag. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of my thinking too. Like the more supports for. Okay. Uh, yeah. And resources for the workers. Right, we, we we can give more, but you know, I, we, I just want to see what's the protocol in uh you know as far as uh, our you know as our partners uh, in there. So we are you know so we don't have to ask them about it, and you know we're we're happy to uh, give that. So we have more to give. So thank you. And Connie, yeah, Martin in the chat was uh, looking for the information on the organization in Quebec. Well, I will send that to you, Mike, right. also for the interest, you know, of all the partners, I will send that information. I don't, it's in Quebec, uh, in Quebec, uh, in French uh, name, so it's, it, it, yeah. really sure how to spell it, so I'll, and I'll reach out to Service Canada as well, so that we have the right and accurate information. Thank you, Connie. Again, if there are any further questions, feel free to raise your hand or pop them in the chat. Um, um, are there any sort of final thoughts on the uh, airport services or um, your providing of them from either Mustafa or Jalen in terms of uh, the importance of it or uh, the sort of continuing need for the project through the ever-changing COVID times we're in. Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> I can go first. I think uh, yeah. what what uh, we've no I've noticed person that's my personal observation is that uh, not only with this move. Uh, of course, I think there's been advocacy from community members for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. But I think with this move, with the government services, now we see that uh, uh, workers are more aware about their rights and, and, and their, their, like, housing improves a lot, has improved a lot, because now there's more investigations and, and, and attention being paid to details. Um, and, you know, they're community programs being available, such as, you know, learning English or even help with applying for the vulnerable uh, uh, permit uh, and, and similar services. So in the last two years, um, I think there's been a, a big increase in, in um, the attention being brought to the situation of workers. Jalen? Yes. I see. Okay. Yeah, I definitely think that um, this is so important. Just even speaking to the workers when we give them the information folder uh, and to see them browse through it and be so just happy that they have this information um, and how important they think it is for all temporary form workers to have access to. And again, just following up with, um, we are building trust with them and then reaching out um, about calls to just having the folder and knowing their rights and reaching out about any issues that they're having with their employers. Um, we've seen an increase in workers feeling more confident um, sharing that and just having that information so that they're able to um, speak out really and know what the standards are that they that they're coming into. Um, so it's been 
it's been really excellent to, to see that and to be receiving those calls and um, that. Um, we have a question in the chat about um, are airline workers a part of bringing TFWs for help or is it um, more of the worker, like people, the support services finding the workers? I can start. Um, for us, it tends to be us finding the workers. Um, as I said, we're covering those exits and um, we tend to come across them and interact with them that way. We have had um, some other departments that might um, come up to us. It tends to be for, um, for language, it's not always necessarily a temporary form worker, or if, sometimes if a department might think that there are temporary form workers coming or something on those lines, they'll let us know if they're aware. Um, but often it is us uh, finding the workers or just again, being aware of those flights and covering the terminals. Yeah, same for us, as Jalen said. Um, yeah, we, we sort of, we know what flights uh, uh, workers come in uh, already, like we've sort of established that uh, in the last two years. And so we plan according um, and uh, they come to us. I just wanted to mention that uh, connected to the previous question that the, we've had a, a large number of uh, Jamaican workers also through, throughout the summer uh, because the flights to uh, Kelowna were, were uh, suspended, then they came through Vancouver. Um, and before we wrap up, Connie, did you have any <laughs> Final thoughts before we go. Yes, and, and yep. well, first a quick question: If you are doing a wraparound service, meaning you're providing service to departing workers as well, um, that is something that you know we're we're kind of lacking here in Toronto, and we've. We've started actually uh, strategizing and planning of being able to provide that service uh, to the party. I think actually Susan's question is more is more related to departing workers because you know for arriving workers once they deplane, uh, air air is no longer have responsibility to, to these workers. So the workers would find their way to immigration, to clear immigration, CBSA, and so forth. But for departing workers, um, there is more engagement with airline uh, workers because they have to check in, they have to weigh their luggages, and they have to pay the, the extra fees. And the challenge or the problem. Uh, airlines would have Spanish speaking or Padua or Tagalog speaking um, it could help uh, these workers understand the whole process of checking in, especially using the, the check-in chaos. Uh, so that's one. The other one is um, well, there are there is a private company that is or kind of paid by farmers to support their workers go through these processes, both for arriving and departing workers. And this is Canac. And I don't know again if this is uh, this is in B this is in place in BC or Edmonton, but Kairos is to provide service to those workers that are not being assessed, assisted by this private company or private enterprise. There's also some loopholes in there because not many workers would know that they're being assisted by Canon. And so they, they roam around and that's when you know our, our staff would, would locate them and, and provide support and then it becomes a problem. <laughs> 
missing here uh, the Toronto Airport and we're, we've been working so hard to, to address this and develop a more uh, collaborative relationship with the airport. So that we have a very good relationship with other key state, stakeholders, particularly government. And, and we You've, you've cut out quite a bit. Sorry. My internet. Oh, I guess uh, just to capture again, our, we're new. Uh, we're not one year old yet providing that service, and we're doing our best in, in improving, you know, the, the, the way we're doing now. And, and Chalen is there at the airport most of the time. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. At the national level, through ESDC, uh, the airport services, for example, we come together. So uh, CAN, uh, CCIS, Kairos, and I think it's RAC, uh, to talk about the work, the challenges, and how and the gaps, and how we're Thank you so much for that. Um, that brings us to the close of the session. Um, oh, Connie did have uh, that question for Mustafa. Uh, do you offer wraparound services um, at this point? No, we don't. We don't. We're wraparound services, meaning that uh, specifically helping them with the domestic departures, we do not. Uh, okay. because, yeah, because the number of clients, the uh, number of workers are departing a lot and we don't know when they're coming. Um, okay. So it, it will prove like it. We just focus on arrivals for now. Thank you for that. All right. Well, thank you for uh, all of this fantastic information. Uh, it's great to see so many supportive services across Canada um, and services not represented here as well uh, that are providing these services for uh, TFWs as they arrive in Canada. Um, as I posted in the chat, our next webinar is a year of the Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers Project. Uh, on December 1st, we're gonna be talking about um, everything that's happened this year. Um, I'm sure the airport services will be part of that as well. Um, it's been, um, quite a ride, I would say. <laughs> um, but uh, we've also provided some really fantastic services and we want to celebrate and uh, look forward on the project. So the link for registration is in the uh, chat. Um, and we will also be sending out information through the uh, Migrant Justice uh, mailing list through Kairos. And you can find uh, sign up for that on kairoscanada.org. Thank you all for your kind attention and thank you especially to our uh, our guest speakers for the day, Jalen and Mustafa. We really appreciate everything you provided today. Uh, and I hope you all have a lovely afternoon. Take care.